Alrighty, so we're finally here. C21 has made it. It received royal assent. <laughs> now nah, we're not doing that again. I mean, what kind of lunatic would actually record an entire video out of focus and then just upload it anyway? You'd have to be crazy, right? Welcome back to the channel. So today we're finally getting around to part two of my C21 explanation. In my first video, I promised a clause by clause, but over the last several months, I've tried recording that multiple times and it always just comes out as like a long, boring drivel, which nobody would want to watch. So instead, I've decided to just do a part two in a similar format to part one. This is mostly going to be a talking head video with not much visual information. So if you want to tab out and listen to this in the background while you're on the go or doing other things, then you aren't going to be missing much. However, just like last time, I am going to be putting these new laws and clauses on screen as I explain them if you wish to read them for yourself. And of course, cue the obligatory disclaimer, but I'm no lawyer, I have no legal background, nothing in this video or on this channel should be considered as legal advice. However, I have read the bill cover to cover several times, so I do have a pretty good understanding of it. Also, the bill covers a number of different areas, including things like the Nuclear Control Act and the Immigration Act. I will not be covering those sections of Bill C-21. I will only be discussing changes to the Criminal Code and the Firearms Act as they pertain to firearm owners and the gun control conversation. But those parts do make up the bulk of the bill. Some of the bill has come into force by now, but many of the clauses still have not. If you do want to know more about the coming into force, Public Safety Canada has put out an article detailing exactly what the current time frame is for most of these provisions. In part one, we discussed the bulk of the changes which I felt were most impactful and applied to the most people. So if you're looking for information on those more mainstream topics, then please go check that video out. Today we're going to be going over the remaining changes, which I feel are less applicable to most firearms owners. There's also a new change to ATCs, or Canada's version of a concealed carry permit, and it's actually kind of interesting, so make sure you stick around for that. So, let's get right into it. We're going to start with more red flag and yellow flag laws, as that's something I didn't really get wholly right in my previous video. Previously, I said red flag laws were called emergency prohibition orders and yellow flag laws were called emergency limitation on access orders. This was a bit of an incorrect assumption on my part, as they were not directly labeled in the bill. It turns out both of these things are their red flag laws and the yellow flag laws are slightly different. So as explained in part one, our new red flag laws permit people to go to court and make an ex parte application to a judge to have your firearms potentially removed for up to 30 days but in some circumstances that can even be extended out to as long as five years. The judge can also hide the applicant's identity, so the application is essentially anonymous. However, at least in this situation, there is a judge involved, but you'd best hope that your judge isn't corrupt or a biased anti-gun nut like we saw from Justice Kane in the CCFR's court ruling last year. These red flag laws have already come into force. However, our new yellow flag laws are not part of that system and have not yet come into force. The yellow flag provisions will permit individuals to contact the provincial CFO's office with concerns regarding a PAL holder in order to have their license suspended for up to 30 days. This power to report extends to all members of the public, including medical professionals. So if you are a PAL holder, you may wish to be careful with what you disclose to your nurses and doctors. Not because I think you should be hiding things from your doctor, but because you don't know what sort of tolerance your doctor will have for your firearms freedoms. And on top of that, you have no way of knowing what constitutes someone who is a risk from their point of view. Additionally, the CFO needs only reasonable grounds to suspect in order to act, which is a very low standard in Canadian law. Reasonable grounds to suspect is essentially that there is merely the possibility and not the probability of something wrong happening. And if that doesn't sound fair to you, <laughs> you better get used to it because you're going to be hearing that phrase a lot in this video. So what this means is literally anyone can call up the CFO and report you. And if they make a sufficient enough argument that it's merely possible that you're no longer eligible to hold a license, your license can be suspended for up to 30 days. Suspension meaning you can still keep your firearms, but you can't use, acquire, or import firearms during the suspension. So even though the barrier of reasonable grounds to suspect is actually rather low, if the only punishment is 30 days essentially without range time, I mean, I, I guess that's not so bad. But at the same time, I fail to see what the point of this is. Like, who is this actually going to help in a meaningful way if suspension is the only punishment? But that's the new red and yellow flag laws, basically, in a nutshell. Red flag is the new ex parte process done through the courts, and yellow flag is the ability to call up a CFO with a complaint. Which actually isn't a new ability. You've always been able to do that. 
but it's a new ability for medical professionals to be able to do that on top of the general public, and it now comes with a lower burden of proof before action could be taken. But the new CFO regulations don't stop there. They've now added two specific conditions for license revocations, and these new revocation conditions have not yet come into force either. When they do, you are now to have your license revoked within 24 hours if the CFO has reasonable grounds to suspect you have engaged in acts of domestic violence or stalking. Now, this has always been the case. You know, people who beat their spouses couldn't normally hold a firearms license even before C21. And CFOs already have the ability and will still have the ability to revoke a license for, quote, any good and sufficient reason. Domestic violence and stalking have always been good and sufficient reasons. The only difference now is it has been officially written into the law as a specific reason. The obvious problem here is, again, that reasonable grounds to suspect. It's just not a high enough bar. But there's a second problem. They actually invented their own definition of domestic violence for the purpose of this rule. Now, for what it's worth, I think this is actually an okay definition, but it's pretty broad. It extends to areas which are not violent, and it even specifically mentions it covers things which would not normally constitute a criminal offense. The problem with this is the rise of victimhood culture in Canada, especially over the last decade or two. A lot of people nowadays genuinely believe they are victims of abuse when relatively benign things happen to them. Couple that with our broad definition and the very low threshold of reasonable grounds to suspect, and you're going to have a perfect breeding ground for confiscating far more licenses and firearms than are necessary to ensure public safety. But again, that's not exactly a new power. What is a new power, however, is a mandatory revocation when a PAL holder is subject to a protection order. Now, for those who don't know, protection orders are essentially things like restraining orders. And again, this has always been a thing which was considered, and action was always an option, but it didn't always necessitate action against a PAL holder. That is no longer the case. If you become subject to a restraining order, or any other kind of protection order, your license will not just be suspended, but revoked. Meaning your license and all of your firearms are to be confiscated and likely destroyed. You will be able to reapply for a new license once your protection order is lifted, but with a black mark on your record like a previous revocation, you will likely have a much harder time getting approved for it again. It is worth noting that this revocation applies only when the protection order is active. So if you have had a protection order filed against you in the past, this will not affect you today, provided this order is not currently still active. However, if you are currently subject to such an order when this portion of the bill comes into effect, it is likely your license will be immediately revoked and your firearms confiscated. So in many ways, this is way worse than even just their red flag laws, as at least in that situation, your firearms are usually only removed for up to 30 days. And of course, just like with the domestic violence revocations, the government invented a new definition for what constitutes a protection order for the purposes of this section. It includes all things which are normally categorized as a protection order, quote, but is intended to include any binding order made by a court or other competent authority in the interest of the safety or security of a person. This includes, but is not limited to, orders that prohibit a person from doing all of these things. Now this definition I am much less satisfied with. It's extremely broad, and it even includes things which are not written down on this list. What's most troubling to me is section E any order prohibiting a person from occupying a family residence. That obviously includes all of the normal things that you'd think of, but here's the thing. Could that also include something like a divorce? It's not unusual in a divorce for one person to get, you know, the house and the kids, and for the other to be ostracized and removed from the home, and the family and the children, and to be given only visitation rights. Is that an order protecting somebody from occupying a family home? It does say the order has to be made in the interest of the safety or security of a person, but separation is often mandated in, you know, the interest of a safe, stable, and structured environment for developing children. A pretty liberal, big L, interpretation of this clause could very easily cover such a thing. So will divorces mean license revocations? I mean, probably not? <laughs> Hopefully it's not their intent to do this, but certainly it's not impossible with a definition as vague as this in a society as anti-gun as ours. So those are the two new official ways for you to lose your license. They aren't exactly new. I mean, these things were always considered and they still were very often penalized, but now the ability to decide has been essentially stripped away from the CFO and the definitions have been significantly broadened in order to mandate revocation as often as possible with as little resistance as possible. But wait, there's more. 
The CFO or the CFP, so that's the provincial or the federal jurisdictions, now also have the ability to more easily share your personal information without the requirement for a warrant if they simply have reasonable grounds to suspect that you are engaging in firearms trafficking or straw purchasing. The list of things that they can share doesn't really seem too harmful, especially if it's used only when combating trafficking and straw purchasing. So it shouldn't really affect people like us. But again, it's that reasonable grounds to suspect. And then section E also allows them to prescribe any additional information they want, anytime they want, through an order and council. And we all know how fair the liberals are with their use of the OIC powers. So that brings us to the end of our increased CFO and CFP powers. Now, like I say, these aren't exactly new powers and they've all previously existed before C-21, but now the bar has been lowered significantly and the path to punishment has been streamlined. That, that, that obviously sucks for us gun owners, but, but we're moving on. So I wanna go over the handgun freeze again quickly because I kind of breezed over it in my last video, but a lot of you had questions or misunderstandings, particularly regarding the exceptions to the freeze. I kind of figured it had been around long enough already that most people already knew what was what, but it turns out that's not the case and lots of people were still into the dark as to exactly what's going on. So the handgun freeze has been in effect since October 21st, 2022. Under the freeze, you are still allowed to use your handguns as normal, but you're not allowed to transfer handguns to individuals anymore. Handguns can still be transferred to businesses, but those will be sold for pennies on the dollar since they can't really sell them back to anyone else. However, you can still technically export handguns. If you have an American friend somewhere who's willing to hold on to your dad's or grandpa's old gun until, you know, if and when we're able to get handguns again in Canada, then that's also an option for you. Now, I'm not going to be detailing export laws here. I, I Frankly, I don't really know them all that well, but you can call the CFO or the CFP for more details on the process or maybe contact your local gun store. So that's basically the freeze. However, there are two exceptions to the freeze, which will still allow individuals to get handgun registration certificates. First off is the exception for the Olympic sport shooting discipline. A lot of people seem to think that handguns can still be acquired for any official sport shooting discipline, like IPSC competitions and so on. But that's just not the case. The only exception for sport shooting is very specifically for participation in the Olympic program, and only very specifically as a part of their specific shooting disciplines. They do not use typical handguns in the Olympics, so even if you could somehow qualify for this exception, you likely wouldn't be able to get guns, you know, like a Beretta 92 or a 1911 or a CZ or a Glock or anything like that. But even if you could, you could likely only get them chambered in 22 LR, since that's the only ammo they actually use in the Olympics. This exception would apply to very few individuals, and you'd likely only be able to get the handguns that they use in the Olympics. So this exception really isn't much of an exception for most people. This means the only realistic way to get a handgun these days in Canada is to have an ATC permit. Now, ATC stands for Authorization to Carry, and it's Canada's version of a carry permit. You can get an ATC only in two circumstances, and that is to protect the life of that individual or other individuals, or for use in connection with his or her lawful purpose or occupation. Here are the criteria required for these categories. I'm not going to go over them in detail, but I will put them on screen for you so you can read them if you're interested. However, it's worth noting that ATCs for protection of life, which is essentially Canada's equivalent of a concealed carry permit, they're, they're borderline impossible to get. Like, I don't know anyone who has one. You don't know anyone who has one. And according to this article from thegunblog.ca, in 2018, there were literally only two individuals with ATCs for the protection of life in the entire country. Now, to be clear, that's not two approved applications that year. That's two people total. So your only real option if you want a handgun through an ATC is to get one for your lawful profession or occupation. And these are, they're genuinely difficult to get, but at least they're less than impossible to acquire. So if you want a way around the handgun freeze, an ATC for your job is about the only realistic way to do it. And even then, it's, it's a bit of a long shot. Or you'd have to apply for your BFL, which is a business firearms license, so that you're no longer just an individual in the eyes of the law. But that's a whole different can of worms. Now, speaking of ATC, C21 actually makes a small tweak to ATCs, which I'm pretty sure is done for all the wrong reasons, but it actually creates a pretty cool side effect, in my opinion. The way it currently works right now is that all ATCs are to be authorized by the CFO at the provincial level. When this portion of C21 comes into effect, that will no longer be the case. If you want an ATC for a job, that'll still be authorized at the provincial level. But if you want an ATC for the purposes of protection of life, that'll be run through the Commissioner of Firearms at the federal level through the Canadian Firearms Program, meaning it's now in the hands of the federal government 
under federal jurisdiction to decide whether or not you're allowed to have an ATC for the protection of life. They have also added a clause in C-21 which says that the commissioner can now refuse your ATC application for, quote, any good and sufficient reason. Combine that with the Liberals' hate on gun use or ownership in Canada, and you can all but expect that the almost zero protection of life ATCs that are out there, they're going to become absolutely zero when this portion comes into effect. I highly suspect that they're just going to blanket deny all applications, even though they are already borderline impossible to acquire. Now what's cool about this though, is that normally ATCs only apply in the province they are issued. Previously, if you wanted to cross provincial lines with an ATC, either for your job or for protection of life, you needed a separate ATC in whichever province you were headed to. That is no longer the case for any ATC issued for the protection of life. Being that it is now under federal jurisdiction through the commissioner, it can apply to any area in Canada, including the entirety of Canada, if they want it to. Now, of course, the opposite is also true. They could just limit it to your city or your neighborhood or even to just your house. Now, like I say, these changes are probably not intended to be beneficial to us. These changes are likely to make the issuance of protection of life ATCs either impossible to get or so geographically restrictive that they're essentially meaningless to have. But someday there may be a federal government in power who isn't so prejudiced against us or perhaps a change in law or legal precedent allowing us to have better self-defense laws. If such a miracle were to ever happen, I think this change could actually have some pretty promising potential for us. The last big thing we're going to be discussing today is, again, not entirely a new rule, but one which could have very serious implications for a YouTuber like myself. And this section has already come into force. It says, quote, Every business or person referred to below commits an offense that advertises a firearm in a manner that depicts, counsels, or promotes violence against a person. Now, the reason I say this is not an entirely new rule is that this was always a condition attached to a BFL's license, and the violation of this condition could have revoked your license. However, now that violation is elevated to the level of a crime, which could land you some seriously legitimate jail time. And the implications are pretty obvious here. If I talk about a specific firearm, you know, it's like a self-defense gun on this channel, is that a crime which could literally send me to jail? Or what if I just shoot it like paper silhouettes with any gun? Is that a depiction of violence against a person? What if it's a picture of a person? What if it's a picture of me? What if someday my channel somehow gets big enough and profitable enough that I can afford to do some ballistics dummies tests? Could I be charged criminally for that? I mean, could these things actually send me to jail? Well, the answer is maybe, probably not. Being that this rule used to be applied to the BFLs, the implication would be that it still only applies to BFLs. And the term business does have a pretty strict definition in the Firearms Act, and it never technically says that it requires a license to qualify as a business, even though it does actually imply it a great many times throughout the act. Meaning, technically speaking, you don't need a BFL to qualify as a business. And technically, I do earn money from YouTube now that I'm monetized. They also never actually define advertise. So that's plenty vague as well. Now they do say there is an exception for those in the film industry or the Canadian Armed Forces or for public safety personnel. Now is YouTube considered the film industry? I mean, probably not, but again, it's not defined, so I kind of have no idea. This new section of the law is all kind of rather vague. And speaking of the film industry, I actually know somebody who definitely qualifies as being part of the film industry. And this person acts professionally and internationally and has also asked me on multiple occasions if I could be an armorer for their movies and so on. Now, I've always said no because I don't have the appropriate license for that in Canada, but I was kind of thinking about maybe doing it. I could always apply for a BFL to be a movie armorer, and if I did that, and I still did YouTube, and even though I have that BFL for a different purpose, does that still make me go to jail if I do these other things on YouTube? So, yeah, I mean, more questions than answers with this one. It's fairly open-ended. Now, the good news here is this doesn't appear to be their intent, at least. If we take a look at the Charter Statement for Bill C-21, they explain rather clearly that this is an evolution of the restrictions placed on business licenses. But if I was able to get a BFL for armoring, and still did YouTube on top of that, that's where things get a little bit tricky for me. If any of you are BFL holders, perhaps you can shed some light on this in the comments down below. I'm pretty sure it's fine, and I'm pretty sure this wouldn't affect me, but at the same time, we've seen plenty of cases lately of judges bending the letter of the law to its absolute limits, in order to rule against gun owners. So I don't know if I should be rolling the dice on this one. Speed round. Now this doesn't change much, but they actually put a definition in for semi-automatic 
in the criminal code. Now, I don't mean a new definition, I mean they finally got around to defining it. Apparently there was no official definition for it before. At least not as far as Section 84 of the Criminal Code was concerned. It says pretty much what you expect it would say, and unlike most of their other invented definitions, this one doesn't look like it's designed for abuse. There's also a new exception laid out in C21 against their two new license revocations, saying that individuals can still get conditional firearms license if they qualify as a sustenance hunter. Now, sustenance hunting doesn't mean anyone who just hunts for food. Sustenance hunting means that their family will starve if they don't hunt. It's a pretty specific criteria, which is rather difficult to qualify for. I've gone hunting basically every year since I was 12, and I'm not a sustenance hunter. But essentially what this would mean is that people who are suspected of domestic violence or stalking, or who are subject to a protection order, may still be able to hold their firearms license in certain situations. And at the very bottom of this bill, there's one last thing to point out. It says, the provisions enacted by this act are to be construed as upholding the rights of indigenous peoples recognized and affirmed by section 35 of the Constitution Act of 1982, and not as abrogating or derogating from them. What this means is everything in this bill is not to be interpreted as violating aboriginal rights, regardless of whether or not anything in here actually does violate their rights. This bill could say that, you know, all aboriginal people no longer have any rights, and that they're slaves to Canada, not that it does say that, but if it did say that, this section here would override it by saying that it's not to be interpreted that way. Now, I don't know how they're even allowed to put that in there. Like, what this effectively says is that the regulations in this bill are unquestionable as a Section 35 charter violation. The Liberals have obviously gotten in pretty significant hot water with their attempts at gun control over the last several years, especially with the Indigenous community. And rather than backing down or trying to operate within the confines of their legal or constitutional obligations, they've gone and essentially said, you know, this doesn't violate Indigenous rights because we say it doesn't violate Indigenous rights. Like, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but I really don't understand how such a thing could even hold any legal water. But that brings us to the end of the bill and all of the notable changes affecting law-abiding gun owners in C21. So, including both parts 1 and 2, we've been talking about the changes in Bill C21 for about an hour now, and detailing all of the new laws which are going to severely impact us lawful gun owners. The Liberals swear it's not about targeting lawful gun owners, and that it's all about getting tough on crime and gun crime. They've regularly boasted that it's the strongest gun control in a generation, and they've even gone so far as to literally say that it will end gun violence once and for all. Bill C-21 is what some have called a complex regulatory response, and it spans literally tens of thousands of words across 65 pages. So I think it's only fair that we finally tell their side of the story by showing the comprehensive list of all of the ways the Liberals are actually going to combat gun violence by getting extra tough on crime and criminals with their new measures which don't actually have any effect on lawful firearms owners. So, here you go. If you want to learn more about the potential effectiveness of C21, I did a video breaking down some handgun stats. If you're more interested in Canadian firearms news, I did a video about the Sydney Island deer cull as well. I plan to do a lot more C21 and firearms content in the future, so get subscribed if you're interested and stay tuned for more updates. All that being said, I'd like to thank you all for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.